Good day. Do you want to hear a story? Great. Sit back, relax, and listen to Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? by Joyce Carol Oates. Goni, a 15-year-old girl, is preoccupied with her appearance. Her mother scolds her for admiring herself in the mirror, but Goni ignores her mother's criticisms. Stop gawking at yourself! Who are you? You think you're so pretty? Connie's mother urges her to be neat and responsible like her older sister. June, who is 24 and still lives at home, works as a secretary at Connie's high school. She saves money, helps their parents, and receives constant praise for her maturity, whereas Connie spends her time daydreaming. Why don't you keep your room clean like your sister? How have you got your hair fixed? What the hell stinks? Hairspray? You don't see your sister using that junk? Their father works a lot and rarely talks to his daughters, but their mother never stops nagging Connie. Connie is often so miserable that she wishes she and her mother were dead. Connie is grateful for June for setting one good precedent. June goes out with her girlfriends, so their mother allows Connie to go out as well with her best friend. Connie's friend's father drives them to a shopping plaza in town and returns later to pick them up, never asking how they spent their time. The girls often snake across the highway to a drive-in restaurant and meet. One night, a boy named Addie invites Connie to eat dinner with him and Connie leaves her friend at the restaurant's counter to go with him. As they walk through the parking lot, she sees a man with a gold convertible. Can I get you, baby? Connie hurries away, and Eddie notices nothing. They spend three hours together at a restaurant and then in an alley. Connie spends the summer avoiding her mother's prying questions and dreaming about the boy she meets. One Sunday, her parents and June leave her at home alone while they go to a family barbecue. Connie washes her hair and doses while she lets it dry in the sun. When she gets hot, she goes inside and listens to the radio. She is startled by the noise of a car coming up her driveway. From the window, she sees that it's a gold convertible and she grows afraid. She walks into the kitchen looks out the screen door, and realizes that the driver is the man she saw in the parking lot the night she met Eddie. The man grins and begins talking to her. I ain't late, am I? Who the hell do you think you are? Told ya, I'd be out. I don't even know who you are. Connie is careful not to show any interest. He points to the words painted on the door. His name, Arnold. You want to come for a- Connie smirked and let her hair fall loose over one shoulder. Don't you like my car? It's new paint job. Hey! What? You're cute! Don't you believe me or what? Look, I don't even know who you are. Hey! Alice got the radio. See? Mine broke down. He lifted his friend's arm and showed her the little transistor radio the boy was holding. Bobby King? I listen to him all the time. I think he's great. He's kind of great. Listen, that guy is great. He know where the action is. Arnold asks Connie to get in the car, but she says... She has things. How do you know what my name is? It's Connie. I never said my name was Connie. But I know what it is. I know your name and all about you. Lots of things. I took a special interest in you, such a pretty girl, and found out all about you, like... I know your parents and sister are gone somewheres 
and I know where and how long they are going to be gone. And I know who you were with last night, and your best girlfriend's name is... Listen, Petty Scouts, Tony Fitch, Jimmy Pettinger, Nancy Pettinger, Raymond Stanley, and Bob Hatter. Do you know all those kids? Look, you're kidding. You're not from around here. Auntie Liz, right now they are uh, they're drinking, sitting around. There's your sister in a violet dress, huh? And high heels, the poor sad bitch. Nothing like you, sweetheart. And your mother's helping some fat women with a corn. She is both horrified and fascinated by his accurate descriptions. Arnold tells Connie that she is his lover and will give in to him and love him. Shut up! You're crazy! She backed away from the door. She put her hands up against her ears as if she'd heard something terrible, something not meant for her. People don't talk like that. You're crazy! She tells him to leave and threatens her to call the police. Arnold, moving unsteadily toward the porch, tells her he will not follow her into the house. She tries to lock the door, but her fingers are shaking too much. Arnold points out that he could break down the door. She asks him what he wants, and he says that he wants her. After seeing her that night, he becomes more threatening, telling her that if she doesn't come out of the house, he'll do something terrible to her family when they come home. Arnold asks Connie whether she knows one of her neighbors, a woman who owns chickens. Hey, you know that old woman down the road? The one with the chickens and stuff? You know her. She's dead! Arnold says again that she should come outside or her family will get hurt. Connie runs from the door and grabs the telephone. In a rushed, blurry scene, something happens. Connie is sweating and screaming for her mother. She can't dial the phone. And Arnold is stabbing her again and again with no tenderness. Connie is sitting on the floor, stunned and terrified. From the door, Arnold tells her to put the phone back on the hook and she obeys. He tells her quietly where they're going to go and tells her to come outside. She thinks to herself that she will never see her mother again and tries to figure out what to do. At his command, she stands up. She feels as tough she is watching herself walk toward the door, open it, and walk outside toward Arnold. He comments on her blue eyes, even though she has brown eyes. Connie looks out at the vast expanses of land behind him and knows that's where she is going.